This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. And uh, she's a garden landscape and social historian based in Shrewsbury. Um, she's done an MA in garden history at the University of Bristol. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> I bet you're all wishing you'd had a strong cup of coffee at the last break, aren't you? Anyway, um, I shan't put you off. Is it left and right? Is it literally left and right? Yeah. yeah, I'll soon find out. A little while ago, I was approached by somebody who wanted to do a feature on people of African heritage involved in horticulture and other similar studies. I readily accepted, and I said, who else have you got in mind? A short, uncomfortable silence followed. Sadly, we are very underrepresented in these disciplines, and indeed I can guarantee that I am always the only little black face when I go to seminars, garden visits, courses, you name it. I'm the only black. So, uh, this is why I became interested in the Reverend Birch Freeman. In 1869, the main coffee grown in the British colonies was coffee Arabica. It was widely reported that the coffee growers in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, and other places had discovered that their plants were being infected and destroyed by a fungal leaf disease, (laughs) Hermilia postatrix. Over a period of two to three years, the infection has severely depleted their coffee production. And the, in the middle, you have the Liberian coffee tree next to a uh, coffee arabica shrub suffering from the leaf disease. The Reverend Thomas Birch Freeman, a pioneer missionary of Anglo-African descent, was instrumental in the introduction of Liberian coffee to England through the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. Freeman recommended that they send this coffee to Ceylon as a possible replacement for the now much debilitated coffee Arabica. Within a year of the cultivation of Liberian coffee at Kew, several Wardian cases or small portable greenhouses full of seedlings were distributed to Ceylon, India, Java and the botanical gardens of Trinidad and Jamaica. Birch Freeman's overwhelming success in founding churches and schools in Nigeria and the Gold Coast, now Ghana, has been extremely well documented in the past. As recently as 1997, the Journal of Religion in Africa published Freeman's case, an article by Paul Ellingworth in which he stated, The period between 1857 and 1873 is naturally of less interest (coughs) to missionary historians, and the latter part of this period remains largely obscure. Frustratingly, this was the exact period of most interest to a garden historian. Apart from his involvement with the introduction of Liberian coffee, nothing is known of his other possible plant introductions to the UK. Yet, as far as we can ascertain, Birch Freeman was the only trained botanist, plant collector, and naturalist who was stationed in the Gold Coast for many years. He had unrestricted access to large areas of specimen-rich regions. Therefore, it is difficult to comprehend how this remarkable man could have escaped the attentions of previous botanical, plant, and garden historians. 
Thomas Birch Freeman was born in 1809 in a small village just outside Winchester. Sources have suggested that his father, Thomas, had previously been a slave on the island of St. Vincent. His mother, Amy Birch, was a housekeeper in the same household where Thomas was employed as a gardener. And very little, no, very little is known about Birch Freeman until 1833 when we find him working as a botanist and head gardener at Orwell Park in Ipswich. And this was the seat of Sir Robert and Lady Anthusa Harland. In that same year, the Ipswich Journal records him as being one of the judges for the Ipswich Horticultural Society. It is probable that Sir Robert had been Freeman's benefactor and paid for his education and training at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. Unfortunately, their archival records, the pre-1841 archival records, have not survived. Therefore, it is difficult to ascertain um, how Freeman came to be trained at Kew. By 1837, he had become an active Methodist. His employer was not happy at having a dissenter under his roof. Freeman was given an ultimatum, his job or his God. A timely appeal by the Wesleyan Missionary Society decided the matter for Freeman and he chose the latter. Nicked that, so it's a bit dodgy, that slide. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, so the society thought that Freeman might serve better in West Africa, especially due to the high prevalence of malaria and other fatal diseases. They assumed, quite correctly as it transpired, that as the son of an African, there was a high probability that Freeman carried some resistance to these diseases which had killed all of their previous missionaries. <laughs> Therefore, at the age of 29, as an ordained minister, Freeman married the former housekeeper at Orwell Park, Elizabeth Boot, and, they departed for the, and, and then they departed for the Gold Coast. On the day that Freeman and his wife um, sailed from Gravesend to West Africa, Queen Victoria had been on the throne less than five months, and David Livingston would not step foot in Africa for another four years. Freeman considered himself to be an English gentleman, and on his arrival on the Gold Coast, it became rapidly, rapidly apparent that he possessed a natural empathy with his indigenous people. He observed their customs, ceremonies, their customs and ceremonies and consistently treated all Africans and Europeans in the same courteous manner. Freeman took full advantage of the free access given to him, which allowed him to continue to document plants and collect, collect and document plants. A month, after his, so his, a month after his arrival, Freeman had his first bout of malaria, which is known as the seasoning fever. Unfortunately, Elizabeth did not survive hers. As a skilled diplomat, Freeman was the first Christian missionary to be admitted into the Ashanti Kingdom. And this lay in the interior of the Gold Coast to the northwest. This opened up new territory for him to study and collect plants. On Tuesday, the 29th of January, 1839, he departed for the capital, Kumasi, armed only with a letter of recommendation two soldiers, both provided by the Gold Coast Governor, Mr. George McLean. And at the River Pra, which formed a natural boundary between the Fanti country and the territories of the Ashanti, Freeman noted in his journal, the Fanti country is covered in luxuriant vegetation. Large forest trees covered, covered with climbers and epiphytical orchidaceae. I noticed a very pretty variety of croton, also a species of gardenia, and a handsome blue variety of maranta. Freeman's arrival at Kumasi was greeted with polite respect but a great deal of suspicion, and he was kept under observation before being allowed to meet King Kwakadoa. 
In order to pass the time, he continued to botanize at every opportunity. <clears throat> and in March, he recorded, I saw a splendid species of epidendrum clinging to a tree at a considerable height from the ground. Anxious to obtain it, I sent a person up the tree. <clears throat> the man, having obtained the plant, descended in safety. I just thought I'd pop this in. <laughs> 19th century orchid collector and an epidendrum species. Not long after his visit to Kamasi, Freeman returned home to England in order to raise funds for more missionaries and money for his projects in the Shanty. Whilst there, he married Lucinda Carroll and he travelled around many of the towns and cities in Ireland, Scotland and Wales, rallying support for his cause. He visited all World Park and presented the Harlands with plant specimens he had collected and a glass house was specially constructed to house these rare specimens. And on the 10th of December 1840, Freeman returned to the Gold Coast with six new missionaries and their wives. Tragically, within two years, all but one of them would be dead, including Lucinda. Consequently, it was not until early November 1841 that Birch Freeman could finally return to Kamasi. And on his arrival, he presented the king with a phaeton carriage. And this sealed their unlikely friendship. And this is an engraving of them carrying this phaeton carriage. And it's strapped to two canoes as they cross the River Prah. And I'm assuming the little chappies over there, one of those must be Birch Freeman. I can't say. And on the back of the receipt of this wonderful present, Freeman records a wonderful conversation with the king. He asked me if palm wine could be obtained in England. I told him it could not, but the palm tea tree was grown in large glass houses heated by fire. Also thousands of plants and trees from all parts of the world. I then told him that I was after looking for plants to take back to England with me. He seemed slightly amused and asked if the plants I took home lived throughout the journey. I told him that, this, that several of them had been growing the last time I left England. Freeman's style continued to rise over the next few years, however, all was not well. His unbridled enthusiasm led him to neglect his finances, and this led to spiralling expenditures. Although there was never any suspicion or direct accusation of any wrong wrongdoing on Birch Freeman's part, in late 1856 he tendered his resignation to the Commission. Sorry, the Committee. Birch Freeman was a very well-educated man who not only had an understanding of botany, taxonomy and horticulture, but also the world of entomology. He maintained a series of diaries whilst travelling around the Gold Coast, and he always carried with him a telescope and a set of books for coloured illustrations of orchids and other plant specimens. And following his resignation, he built a house near Accra, and established a model farm called Beulah Gardens near the banks of the River Siku. John Milam, in 1893, uh, wrote one of his first biographies, and he states that Freeman not only gave himself these agricultural pursuits, he went to considerable pains in the interest of science to procure rare and valuable species of orchids from the forest. For many years, he corresponded with the authorities at Kew and supplied not only rare specimens of plants, but also useful information. In 1862, Sir Richard F. Burton, an explorer, writer, and ethnographer, traveled to Accra. He has specifically included a visit to Beulah Gardens as part of his trip to West Africa. And this would indicate that Freeman's work and reputation was certainly recognised at that time. The details of Burton's travels, entitled Two Trips on the Gold Coast, were later published in the Geographical Review between 1873 and 1874. 
and Burton Road. Mr. Freeman began work about the end of 1859, and by degrees he, he reclaimed 14 acres, of which eight are under coffee despite a plague of lizards. Meanwhile, he grows maize, peppers, radishes, rhubarb, etc. His pomegranates will not ripen, and his muscatel grapes must be guarded with bags against wasps. His coffee shrubs are all grown from seeds. Mr. Freeman owned about 8,000 shrubs of all sizes. Burton then, Burton then continues to list the many tropical trees, shrubs, and plants which have been collected by Birch Freeman. But how do we make a connection between what was taking place and in Blue, at Beulah Gardens and the wider world? On September 25th, in 1872, Freeman, writing from Beulah Gardens, responded to a letter from Mr. Salmon, who was the acting administrator of the Gold Coast. And Freeman wrote, I have the honour to acknowledge the receipt of Your Excellency's letter with the accompanying copy of a letter from Dr. Hooker of the Botanic Gardens of Kew, inquiring after seeds of the native or Liberian coffee tree. I have many healthy young plants of this valuable variety of coffee and I, can therefore, I therefore have the pleasure of forwarding to Your Excellency upwards of 200 of the seeds required. From what I have experienced of the habits of this variety of coffee, I am of the opinion that if it be desired to introduce it to Ceylon to as great an extent as, as may be practicable, the berries will travel safely. Freeman then describes the process by which the successful harvest, storage and transportation of the coffee seeds could be achieved without reducing their viability. This would confirm that Freeman was very much aware of the coffee production catastrophes taking place in Ceylon and the other colonies. Now, plant specimens sent to the Botanic Gardens at Kew are recorded in inward bound volumes. And the records of 1868 and 1872 confirm that on the 31st of October, the middle one there, Kew Gardens were in receipt of 480 seeds of Liberian coffee from T.B. Freeman Esquire, Beulah Gardens, Accra, Gold Coast. The following year, Freeman wrote a letter and he said, I am very glad to find that the coffee seeds changed hands in good condition and I shall feel a pleasure in sending you more seeds. And later that year, at the age of 64, he formally returned to the ministry and continued his Christian pursuits, while intermittently corresponding with Q and the local government in Ceylon. Birch Freeman died on the 12th of August, 1890, aged 81. In November of that year, the Q Bulletin published the following. 480 seeds were obtained from the Reverend T. <coughs> Freeman near a small plantation of the coffee on the Seacoon River near Accra. The plants raised from these seeds at Kew were the first grown in this country. So while it is true that the discovery and or introduction of a plant does not automatically lead to one's name being associated with in 1874, a nurseryman called William Bull advertised Liberian coffee as Coffee Liberica in his trade magazine. This name was then adopted by Mr. William Hearn, who then published a detailed botanical description of the plant. And therefore, the rules of botanical nomenclature determined that the recognized name for Liberian coffee is coffee, Liberica, Bull, X, Hearn. Birch Freeman's pivotal role in recommending the potential solution to the coffee crisis in the colonies, as well as his remarkable skills in botany and horticulture, has been greatly overshadowed by his 
remarkable religious legacy. These workshops are asking what's happening in black British history. I started this research on the back of the first workshop. So something is happening. <laughs> the reason why this period in Birch Freeman's life has remained obscure is that nobody has had cause to research or write about it until now. My research aims to redress this and in time enable the reference Thomas Birch Freeman's name to appear next to other notable Victorian botanists, plant collectors and horticulturalists. Thank you.